If you've heard anything lately about tests, it's that we haven't performed enough of them in the United States. Today, everyone is so focused on getting tested, they miss the point that a bad test is worse than no test. And that may be another, more fundamental problem. Just how good are the tests in the first place? The FDA basically has created a wild, wild west environment for this testing, where under their approval process on an emergency basis, they've let tests on the market that basically have a very, very wide range of results. Michael Osterholm is director of the Center for Infectious Disease Research and Policy at the University of Minnesota. The quality of these tests right now vary a great deal, and that's a challenge in terms of understanding if you get a negative result, is it really negative? A molecular diagnostic test can determine if you have actual virus inside of you by drawing a sample from your nasopharynx or from your saliva by spitting into a vial like I did and then testing it for genetic traces of the virus. How well the test can find those genetic markers is known as sensitivity. If a test has poor sensitivity, it will result in too many false negative results. That means too many people testing negative for the virus when they are actually infected. We undertook a study where we looked at over 200 specimens and tested them by all five methods. And there are differences between these tests. Dr. Gary Prokoff is head of virology at the Cleveland Clinic. He and his team found three tests to have sensitivity over 95%. The one from the CDC, Cepheid, and Roche, meaning they caught nearly all but 5% of cases. But the highly touted Abbott ID Now test, which can give results in minutes, missed up to 15% of infected patients. Another study found that it potentially missed 25% of infections. And that's a concern, because despite their negative test results, those people are actually infected and can still spread the virus. You would never want to use that test to screen somebody in the hospital to put them into a COVID negative unit because in that case, you can't afford to make a mistake. In a statement, Abbott said that the type of viral transport media, the chemical used to carry the virus sample, could be diluting samples. We immediately communicated with our customers that they should use the direct swab method. The findings of Prokof's study are still yet to be peer-reviewed. When asked if accuracy was sacrificed at the expense of speed, an FDA spokesperson told CNN, FDA oversight doesn't end with an EUA, or emergency use authorization. We will continue to track these tests and take action if required. Even in the middle of a pandemic, people still have to grocery shop. And grocery stores are considered essential businesses. Now, the conventional wisdom is limit the number of trips to the grocery store. That can be hard. Maybe you can't buy everything at once, or you don't have enough room in your house to store everything. So I want to show you today how to do this as safely as possible. The key is to plan ahead. So I got my list. You want to get in and out of there as quickly as possible. That means moving efficiently through the store and thinking about every surface you might touch. You don't want to dilly down. Think of yourself sort of like a SWAT team member. Get in, get out, leave as little trace of yourself as possible. So let's go do this. Now, keep in mind, when you go to the grocery store, it's about your own safety, but it's really about the safety of the frontline workers. I'm gonna get in and out pretty quickly, but the frontline workers, they're here all day, so they're more at risk. One of the things that's nice about this particular store is that Richard here is wiping down all the surfaces. Thank you. I uh, carry my own hand sanitizer with me just in case. I really wasn't quite sure what to expect. But I can tell you, it's pretty quiet here in the grocery store. They reduce capacity, and they keep special hours for people who are medically vulnerable. Seven to eight in the morning, Monday through Thursday. My kids really wanted to come with me today. They wanted to get out of the house. But shopping nowadays is pretty much a solitary activity. And keep in mind, don't touch anything that you're not gonna buy. Be very focused. Get some eggs. And we're moving on. I have kids. So this is how they do it in the grocery store. Please wait here. That keeps you six feet away from people.
What we're seeing at the moment is the expansion of intensive care way beyond the traditional boundaries. The physical space that the intensive care is occupying, where we're looking after COVID-19 patients, is getting bigger and bigger all the time. When we're looking after critically ill patients, we need a bed space that will accommodate both the bed itself with the patient on it, but also around that, the devices that contribute to life support. The equipment that we have in intensive care units is really divided into two categories. The first is the life support machines, the ventilator being a great example. The main challenge that we're finding in patients with COVID-19 is in the damage it does to the lungs, which means it's hard to get oxygen into the body. Kidney support machines place the function of the kidneys for the period of time it takes the patient to recover. Any drugs that we're administering will need special pumps to deliver them. When patients get really sick, we can have a machine that takes over the function of the heart and lungs. Some of those will also not just get oxygen into the blood, but help the pumping of the blood around the body. And then the second type of equipment we have are uh, monitoring devices. So these might be looking at the electrical trace of the heart, the blood pressure. And then we also have devices to measure the level of oxygen in the blood. So there's a lot of very expensive technology. We're looking at thousands, if not tens of thousands of pounds, and all that resource is focused on a single individual. We have a remarkably large number of nurses to support that activity. So our hospital, which has 1,200 beds, employs more than 10,000 people. It's been astonishing seeing how people have risen to the challenge. We're likely to have, for a period of months, if not even years, two parallel health systems, one of which is dealing with COVID, but another one which is attempting to recreate what we always used to do. We've really got to focus on looking after the staff and ensuring that they can continue to provide a service going forward through COVID and beyond.